So back at Joey's house, she's woken up again to find an old-fashioned radio in her closet. This radio is the very first thing we see in Hellbound before it pulls back to reveal Proto Pinhead trying to solve the Lament configuration. It wasn't playing music, though. She fiddles with the knob a bit until... Go to the window, Joey. There's a familiar scene. He apparently cannot see or hear her, but a door opens. She walks through it, and no, we're not gonna see hell again, sadly. She ends up on a battlefield at nighttime. I don't understand. Am I dreaming this? You'll have to help me. Forgive me. So we find out that this guy, along with being Proto Pinhead from the previous movie, is the ghost of Captain Elliot Spencer. Well done. Brave girl. You've probably never shaken hands with a ghost before, am I right? What the hell is going on? Hell is exactly what is going on, Joey. And we have to stop it. He says that he needs her help because he cannot interact with the real world, only her dream world. He explains that the war had destroyed him, and as most ex-soldiers became alcoholics, he discovered a different kind of addiction. Cue a recap of the opening to Hellbound, and then Pinhead's death. Monster as I was, I was bound by laws. Hell has its commandments too, you know. Told by the man himself. Except that he didn't die exactly. Pinhead's humanity died, but the demon part of him continued to exist, trapped in the pillar. Well, no longer, Joey. The shell of the beast has been fleshed. You know, he's part of Pinhead, so I'll allow it. The shell of the beast has been fleshed. What I was is out there in your world. So he explains that if she opens the box, it'll bring Pinhead to this other dimension and they can rejoin. It's also mentioned that Pinhead cannot take the box from her, but he can persuade her to give it to him. So she has to be careful about that. Gotta say I'm not a fan of the whole club setting. I think they're trying to capture that dark feel that Hell had in the previous movie, but it just feels so contrived to me. Also, the movies have had a quiet dignity about them, which was echoed in the previous scene, and then we cut from that to loud-ass rock music, and it's really jarring, in a bad way. This- this isn't why I'm watching a Hellraiser movie. I can see this shit anywhere. Anyway, stuff in the club starts to come to life. I'm suddenly having Nightmare on Elm Street 2 flashbacks. I'm here to help you. Help yourself, fucker! Shall we begin? So Pinhead wastes everyone in the club in really gruesome ways. <laughs> and that's pretty much the whole scene. Also, death by icicle fellatio, because why not? I do get a kick out of the shot at the end where we see blood seeping out from under the door and the screams get progressively quieter as there are fewer people left alive. So Joey hears about it on the news and she calls her camera guy and he agrees to meet her there because he's closer. So she goes and takes the puzzle box with her. And then it's revealed that the news story was an illusion to lure her there. And when she gets there, she can't find the cameraman. Lots of dead bodies though. Oh my god, is that guy hanging from a hook by his tongue? Ugh. <laughs> These corpses range from horrific to comical. Didn't I see something like that in a Tom and Jerry cartoon? I also had to pause here to realize that this guy is on a poker table, with poker chips meticulously glued around the edges for some reason, and there are dice in his eyes and poker chips in his mouth, and he's wrapped in Christmas lights for some reason. Okay, that part I caught, but for how quickly they show this, it's hard to tell what all is going on as far as the poker stuff. And then there's the cameraman. Now I'm reminded of Sonic Dreams collection. Oh, it's unbearable, isn't it? The suffering of strangers, the agony of friends. Its sound is like razors through flesh. Oh, come. A 
Oh, you can hear its faint echo right now. Oh, no, you can't stop me, child. But you don't have to hear the music. So Pinhead tries to convince her to give him the box. You're gonna have to come and get me, you ugly fuck. Oh, spirited. Yes, Pinhead, we know you like it when they play hard to get. Oh, I'll enjoy making you bleed. And I'll enjoy making you enjoy it. That was a great line. <sighs> so Joey lightly jogs away from Pinhead. Seriously, this is not the body language of someone who is running away in terror. She looks like she's rushing to get to work on time or something and is being careful not to get too sweaty or anything. You know, I get that she's the main character and so obviously she isn't going to die, at least not yet. But it's a bit weird that we just saw Pinhead horrifically slaughter a building full of people, yet he can only slightly injure this one person. Have you seen what he did to me, you little bitch? Freddy, is that you? But yeah, her cameraman has been turned into a Cenobite during the, like, 10 minutes he was off screen. To be fair, I guess it didn't take that long for Chenard to become a Cenobite in the previous movie either. But at least a lot happened during that time, so it felt like a lot of time had passed. Plus, we saw part of it, and at least it felt like a big event. In this movie, it happens off screen to everyone, and it's treated like an afterthought. Whoa, what the f <laughs> Ready for your close-up, Joey? Maybe it is Freddy. And there's the DJ who is now CD head. I'm gonna talk more about it later, but long story short, I am not a fan of the Cenobite designs in this movie. And there's another one called Barbie. The cops try to intervene. But that goes about as well for them as you'd expect. Shit! Gasoline! And because if there's one thing the earlier Cenobites lacked, it was pithy catchphrases. That's a wrap. So glad they corrected that. Anyway, Joey takes refuge in a church. <gasps> they just keep coming. They just keep coming. Who keeps coming? The demons! The demons! The demon! <laughs> the demon! The demon! The demon! Also, that was a really goofy sounding read. I can't believe they didn't do another take of that. Demons? Demons aren't real. They're parables, metaphors. Then what the fuck is that? Okay, that was funny. Welcome to one of my favorite scenes from this whole franchise. That is a hell of an entrance. I love how the church itself seems to be quaking in fear. How dare you! Thou shalt not bow down before any graven image. That's right, he knows all your little sayings and can use them against you. <laughs> By the way, an earlier script had those little worm things at the ends of the pins burrowing into his hands. I guess they couldn't get the effect right, so instead Pinhead just sticks the pins along with the worms into his own hands. Which makes the worms a bit pointless, but the effect is more like a crucifixion. I... I'm the way. Really, this scene has no point other than Pinhead mocking Christianity and generally being awesome. You're burned in hell for this! Wow, that priest is dumb. Burned. Oh, such a limited imagination. <laughs> this is my body. This is my blood. Happy are they who come to my supper. He's just like, I am Jesus now, bitch. What are you gonna do about it? Ew. Come on. Come on. Come on and get it. This is what you want. <laughs> and Joey goes for another little jog. And now we see that JP and Terry have become Cenobites. Again, off screen. I can dream now, Joey. Oh, you wouldn't believe what I can dream of now. Relax, baby. This is better than sex. Get it? Cause JP liked to bang a lot of women, ha! Huh? <laughs> and why is Joey just standing there? <laughs> The Handmaid, Joey. A shadow of my former troops. <laughs> That's putting it nicely. Play with this, 
So Joey finally does something useful and solves the puzzle box, sending back all the Cenobites. But then she gets sent somewhere. A bright sunny field where her father is waiting for her. It's a reward, oh daddy. <laughs> They said you'd have something for me. Something you won't need anymore. This? Here, take it. God damn it, Joey, you had one job. Thank you, Joey. <laughs> Couldn't resist playing games, could you? Captain Spencer to the rescue. And now. We're going to hell. Ladies first. No! You'll like her better this way. Trust me. Why does this movie feel the need to make Pinhead look goofy? Why? There is a world out there waiting to yield to us. So much flesh. So many different pleasures. So now it's the good and bad halves of Pinhead against each other with Joey hanging in the balance. You're right. We do belong together. And when Captain Spencer grabs Pinhead, for some reason they merge. And for some reason that doesn't seem to do anything. Now, where were we? Though apparently Captain Spencer is in there, he just has a hard time having any control. Joey! Send me to hell! So it helps, it just doesn't cause Pinhead to revert to how he was previously. Go to hell. I guess if she can't open the box, stabbing him with it will do? Jesus, even his death looks goofy. Bye Pinhead, see you next movie. So only the box is left and Joey goes to a construction site and drops it into some wet cement. Good thing that's the only one, huh? Granted, she can't really know that, but I don't think this movie does either. Or the next one. Apparently depositing the puzzle box at this construction site somehow results in the coolest looking building ever. The end. So that was Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth. I want to like this movie, I really do. On one hand, it has some of my favorite pinhead scenes from the series. This movie makes him look so awesome. Usually. But those bits are just kind of floating in a sea of mediocrity. I just cannot get into the first half of this movie. The previous movies had Pinhead not making an extended appearance until past the halfway mark. In the first movie, it was two-thirds of the way through, but they kept it interesting with compelling characters. This movie has Pinhead showing up only about a third of the way through, and not only do they make him look silly up until the halfway point, but the other characters just do not carry this movie on their own. I kind of like Terry because she's kind of adorable and I just can't help it, but I don't care about the drama between her and Joey and her and JP. JP is a tool and is no substitute for Frank. And while I normally like Terry Farrell, Joey is little more than the glue holding this plot together. She's not interesting and there isn't even any real closure for her character arc. The movie brings up her wanting to be a serious reporter and that she has unresolved issues with her father's death. And neither is really resolved unless you count her finding out secondhand that she got a job she wanted. Even the soundtrack is uninspired. It's mostly club music combined with reused tracks from the first movie. Or if they aren't, they at least sound like it, whereas Hellbound's soundtrack was more unique sounding. I mean, I picked up the soundtrack CD at a thrift store recently and just look at the track listing on the back. First of all, nothing by Christopher Young who did the music for the first two movies. And I mean, one of the songs is done by KMFDM, who is also on the Mortal Kombat movie soundtrack. Not to pick on them or anything. This kind of music is fine as action movie soundtrack fare, but for a Hellraiser movie? However, the scenes involving Captain Elliot Spencer are great, and it's nice seeing Doug Bradley without makeup for a change. He has a certain charm and a demeanor that commands respect. He's compelling, is what I think I'm trying to say. And the second half of the movie is entertaining and fun, though a lot of what's entertaining about it falls into so bad it's awesome territory. This feels like two different movies awkwardly squished together and... Frankly, it focuses far too much on the club and rock bullshit in the first half. 
In fact, the abrupt cut from this scene to the next... Very inventive. ...is kind of the general feel of this movie in a nutshell. So, I guess I recommend this movie in a mindless entertainment sort of way, but it is a huge step down from the first two. So this is the point where I talk about the Cenobites. It's probably going to be shorter than usual because even in the movies that aren't that great, usually the Cenobites are interesting. These ones are just so gimmicky. Like, this guy has a camera which appears to be almost comically shoved into his head. Really, his mustache sets him apart more than anything else because Cenobites are usually hairless and this is the first one we've seen with facial hair. Other than that, he has a bunch of vertical cuts that can be seen through big windows in his outfit. Moving on. CD Head has CDs in his head, along with a CD tray in his chest which dispenses CDs that he uses like shurikens, which is kinda silly. He also has chains on him. Moving on. Barbie is kind of the butterball of this movie, only he's wrapped in barbed wire and breathes fire. That just leaves us with the Cenobites that the two of the main characters from earlier in the movie became. JP becomes Piston Head because there are pistons in his head. He is at least unique in that we can hear the pistons making whirring sounds as they constantly jab in and out of his head and it causes him to have this sort of facial tick. I have to admit that's kind of cool. Terry becomes Dreamer, who is the least gimmicky of the Cenobites of this movie. There are hooks around her face stretching the skin. Her forearms are flayed with the effect looking like opera length gloves. And there is an opening on her neck where a cigarette has been inserted, which she is constantly smoking. Other than that, her outfit is very skimpy, which is kind of fitting as it echoes how she dressed when she was human. The Cenobite Wiki refers to these as pseudo-Cenobites, because they were made quickly and still have a memory of when they were human. But all that applies to Chenard's Cenobite as well, and he's considered a full-on Cenobite, so I don't know if there's really anything to that or not. As for Pinhead... This is my body. This is my blood. Happy are they who come to my supper. Yes, there are about two to three scenes with him that I love, and he has some great lines. I am the way. But there's an interesting conundrum with this character. He has great dialogue and a wonderfully majestic appearance, along with a certain mystique. Therefore, we think we want to see more of him. The problem is that when he's on screen too long and has too much dialogue, he loses that mystique, and a lot of what endears him to us. So, believe it or not, in a way, one of my complaints about this movie is too much Pinhead. We really should not have seen him until this scene, and he should have had a lot less dialogue overall. He pretty much never shuts up when he's on camera. He basically becomes that kind of villain that just constantly yammers about his motivations, and he emotes too much again, although it's much worse in this movie than in the previous one. Not to mention that we see him get reduced to a slasher film villain. Although I admit it's an intriguing concept on its own. Take a torture technician and give him free reign to let him kill as many people as possible as horrifically as possible and just watch the bodies hit the floor. And I know there was an explanation for his acting this way, but still, I guess what I'm saying is that it's an interesting concept but not really a good idea in practice. So at least this movie got it out of the way so we could get it out of our systems and not have to see it again. Also, this scene played out differently in an earlier script. Pinhead confronted a police officer and silenced him by putting one end of a handcuff through his tongue. And of course, it was followed by the scene in the church, so the idea was that Pinhead had a confrontation with humanity's law, and then he is confronted with spiritual law, and neither means anything to him because he is just that badass. It's too bad that was left out of the final product. Also, I'm sure I'll never hear the end of it if I don't mention that there was music by Motorhead in this movie. It's a good song and all, but again, I'm not too crazy about having rock music in a Hellraiser movie, so I just can't get too excited about it. However, I have to admit that the video is pretty cool. Naturally, it involves clips from the movie, but they also had Doug Bradley appear as Pinhead, and he plays poker against the lead singer. And loses? What the fuck? Okay, you lost me there, video. Not cool. Anyway, I hate that I've sounded so negative, but honestly, whenever I thought of this movie, I would tend to think of that scene where Pinhead first appears outside of that silly pillar, and when he torments the priest, and now that I'm watching it again, I find the rest of it to be disappointing. I know I'm in the minority here, but I actually prefer the following movie, Bloodline. Granted, it's been a while since I've seen it, so we'll see if I still feel that way when I get to it. Anyway, that's about all I have to say about Hellraiser 3 Hell on Earth. 
I do recommend it just for the second half, even if it's just a lot of dumb fun. That's it for now. See you next time. Metaphors. Then what the fuck is that?